Hi, everybody. For those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Dr. Mary Claire Haver. Sorry, I'm looking up and pulling up my notes. And today I'm coming here to you live to talk about foods that cause inflammation. So I'm going to hang out just for a couple minutes for TikTok to notify people that I am live and to see how many of you want to join in. <clears throat> so this is a topic that I get questions about all the time, you know, what foods cause inflammation. And I think for some of you, it can be pretty radical to realize you have been suffering from information overload and probably a lot of misinformation about what things actually cause inflammation in your diet. And um, so, to, and things that cause universal inflammation for everyone. Now, there are certain foods that will cause inflammation in individual people if they're missing certain enzymes, um, if they have conditions like celiac disease and they cannot tolerate gluten at all, if they have, you know, irritable bile, et cetera. But here I'm talking about things that are inflammatory in just about every single person. And... Um, Hang on one second. So um, at the top of that list, at the top of that list. So for those of you just joining, double tap the screen to like the video. I get notifications from TikTok if you, um, to try to keep me relevant on this app. So I am Dr. Mary Claire Haver. I'm, uh, this is my clinic, Mary Claire Wellness. I am a board certified OBGYN physician. I'm also the creator and founder of the Galveston Diet. And I've become sort of a menopause warrior. So most of my followers are women and, and the majority of you are older than 35. So if you are not in that demographic, you are always welcome. The information that I give, especially about nutrition and inflammation, actually works for everyone. So um, I'm also a 53-year-old menopausal mom of two girls. Um, and super happy to come live and share this information with you. So again, double tap the screen and feel free to follow me. If you, Oh, thank you for the heart. That's awesome. Follow me and like this video and share this video. So you can share by clicking the little right arrow down there below and comment like crazy. Now, if you have, and comments also help drive engagement in this live. If you have any questions, just drop them in the question mark down here below. Um, and so, okay, so foods that cause inflammation. So I want to see in the comments section what foods you think are the top causes of inflammation. Okay, I also just did a TikTok about this. So you might be cheating if you saw that video. Um, so um, uh, 52, you're 60, what do I recommend? Is nausea normal for menopause? You can definitely have gastrointestinal changes that happen in menopause while I wait for the answers. Tomatoes, sugar, bread and sugar, carbs, carbs, sugars, gluten, processed food, milk products and meat, bread. Okay, so what I asked are these people who are joining in now are, um, oh, I got a TikTok universe, thank you, um, is what foods do you think cause inflammation? What do you think are the top inflammation causers? of uh, nutrition-wise, what do you think? So um, carbs, caffeine, uh, grains, gluten and alcohol, dairy, sugar, alcohol, sugar and carbs, booze, dairy, sugar, uh, dairy, sugar, stress, okay, sugar and veggie oil, lactose, alcohol, sugar, grains, processed foods. Um, okay, so when I talk about inflammation, I'm not talking about allergies I'm not in, um, or intolerances. I am talking about foods that set off an inflammatory reaction either by directly affecting the gut mucosa and inflaming the wall of the gut um, or disrupting the gut microbiota. So we are learning a lot more about our gut microbiome which are the bacteria and um, the, the uh, microbiome that lives in our gut. And it's, it's meant to be there. 50% of what you, I think 50% I think by weight, if I have that wrong, any scientists out there, let me know. But it's a high number of our poop, or 80%, it's a lot, is bacteria, dead bacteria coming out. So we are constantly living in an environment where our gut is, is filled with healthy bacteria. It's meant to be, and it is our job to eat nutritionally so that we keep the gut healthy. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is a process that allows our immune system to fight a stimulus. Okay. We need inflammation. Inflammation saves us, keeps us healthy. So there's acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation is very easily recognizable. It's what happens when you step on a nail, when you twist your ankle, you have this immediate response where you have 
um, blood rushing to the area. You have cytokines rushing to the area to fight off the invader. You have all of this like um, cascade of things happening to surround the, the stimulus and get rid of it, okay, and destroy it. And so chronic inflammation is more what happens on a nutritional basis where it doesn't set off this huge inflammatory process. It's this kind of low-grade chronic inflammation. And that seems to be what causes the most chronic disease. And so, um, okay, so acute inflammation, normal healthy response, how we fight off invaders, how we fight off COVID, how we fight off viruses, how we fight off, you know, acute injury. Chronic inflammation, however, is a slow, ongoing, destructive process and ends up being part of the reason why, set, part of the um, pathology of seven of the 10 leading causes of death for all people. So it acts like a slow burning fire and it's very, very hard to get rid of. And a lot of it is driven by nutritional choices. Okay. So I'm getting to the great, I'm getting to the, um, okay. The relationship between inflammation and food. So research shows, you know, and I know a lot of you are, are some of you might be a little science, um, science averse, but the research I read shows that um, a significant contributor to chronic inflammation is what we eat, okay? And you may find that many of the following inflammatory foods have a place in your diet. And when you eat them daily, you may be constantly turning on your body's immune system in the form of chronic inflammation. Yes, that's my name, Mary Claire Haver. I'm Dr. Mary Claire Haver. The name of my clinic is Mary Claire wellness. So, um, okay. So these foods are inflammatory for a variety of reasons, everything from some allergies. So definitely if you have like a milk out, you know, milk protein allergy or whatever, that's inflammatory. Okay. Um, half the world's population has an allergy to dairy. Go figure. And, um, but you can cause changes in the gut bacteria and chemicals that are being recognized as foreign in the form of artificial flavors and colors and irritants such as nitrites and nitrates and many, many, many more. So when we look at the top foods that kind of have a constellation of all of these things, um, hang on. So, um, so here are the top, the top bad actors and some of them may refine you. So number one is processed flours process flour. Refined wheat flours have been stripped of their slow digesting fiber and nutrients, which means your body can break down the foods made from these ingredient, this ingredient very, very quickly. This is white flour, okay? It is the number one ingredient in cookies, crackers, white bread, all the things. Um, so you've taken a pretty innocent kernel of wheat, not because it has gluten. Most people are not sensitive to gluten. The vast majority of human beings are not sensitive to gluten, okay? You're probably sensitive to having too much sugar in the form of processed carbohydrates, and that's what's making you sick, not the gluten protein, okay? So the more quickly your body digests glucose-containing foods like white flour, um, the faster your blood sugar spike, which also spikes your insulin level, and high insulin levels create a pro-inflammatory response. The Journal of Nutrition found that a diet that is full of high levels of processed carbohydrates in the form of white flour um, show a greater concentration of the inflammatory marker PA-alpha-1 in the blood. In the other hand, a diet rich in whole grains, whole grains, okay, um, results in a lower concentration of the same marker as well as most well-known inflammatory bio biomarkers like C-reactive protein. Okay, so am I talking too fast? Are you guys getting this? Thank you for sharing the video. I really, really, really appreciate it. Um, I have multiple studies like this. Really, you're, you're asking me that. That is just one study, but I actually have multiple, and they're all listed. I have an extensive uh, science database in our program. If you want to go and look up all the medical articles, you're more than welcome. So please like the video, share the video, double tap the screen. So we're up to 700 viewers. Hi. So TikTok is telling me to reintroduce myself. I'm Dr. Mary Claire Haver. I am a board-certified OBGYN physician. I'm also a nutritionist. I'm not a registered dietitian. That's a whole different degree. I have, um, I am certified in culinary medicine, which is basically marrying nutrition and medical therapy. And so I did 18 months of training at Tulane University to get that certification. So I'm, I'm board certified OBGYN, women's health specialist, as well as have a strong nutrition background. And I've taken all of that together 
and uh, put it together in my program called the Galveston Diet. So today I'm talking about foods that are pro-inflammatory. Now, if you want to jump off and go learn more about the Galveston Diet or take our inflammation quiz, you can just click on the Galveston Diet logo up here, that link with my picture on it. That'll take you to my TikTok page. And there's a bolded link at the top that says blah, 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 link in bio. Click on that and you can take our quiz. You can learn, read our blogs, learn more about what we have to do. And so um, if you have questions, put them in the question box down below. Comment all you want, but they they scroll by really quickly. It's hard for me to get to the questions. And also double tap the screen to like the video. My God, we're up to 800 viewers. Share this video. Okay, so next, number two, sugar. Next, so number one is processed carbohydrates. We're talking about pro-inflammatory foods. Sugar, 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 sugar. When we eat too much glucose-containing sugar, the excess glucose in our body cannot process quickly enough, okay? Um, and then it causes an increase in pro-inflammatory messengers called cytokines, okay? Um, sugar also suppress suppresses the effectiveness of our white blood cells germ-fighting ability, weakening our immune system and making us more susceptible to infectious disease. There was a study, another study in the Journal of Nutrition that discovered on an equal calorie diet, so you seco people out there who love to hate on me, um, these are real medical articles published in nutrition journals, okay? The Journal of Nutrition, the gold standard, the people who are the smartest in the world of nutrition, okay, discovered that on an equal calorie diet, so same amount of calories, okay, those who ate a low, simple carbohydrate diet, meaning they did not have a lot of processed carbs, they did not eat a lot of cookies and crackers and white flour and breads, okay, reduced their level of the bioinflammatory marker C-reactive protein, whereas those participants on a high, simple carbohydrate diet did not. And when you lower your chronic inflammation levels, your enzymes work better, your metabolism works better, the way you process things works better, you stop driving visceral fat to the abdomen, and you end up healthier. Healthier, okay? Um, oh, the ring, thank you, my husband, very generous. Um, 15th anniversary ring. So um, when you eat something loaded with sugar, your taste buds, your gut, and your brain I'll take notice. Let me say that to you in the back. We all know this. When we eat something high in sugar, you're eating that donut, you're diving into that beautiful piece of cake, it's your birthday. You know, I'm not saying all sugar is bad, just these are the things you have to realize that people that chronically eat high sugar, okay? Your taste buds, take notice. What happens with your taste buds? They are stimulated. It sends a signal to your brain saying, get ready, your stomach, stomach get ready, bloodstream get ready, sugar is coming, and your insulin levels start rising compensatorily. Okay, your brain, do you know that sugar, in several animal studies, sugar is more addictive than cocaine. The little animals they had in the maze went to sugar more often than they did cocaine. They wanted the sugar more than cocaine. I'm not making this up. There's two or three studies out there documenting this in animal models. You can't do that to a human. It would be unethical. So um, this activation of your reward system, this is why the sugar addiction thing is real, okay? Your reward system is activated, not unlike how our bodies process other addictive substances, such as alcohol or nicotine. The overload sugar spikes your dopamine level and leaves you craving more. Leaves you craving more, okay? Um, so, Number three, so we talked about processed carbohydrates in the form of white flour, and we talked about sugar. Number three is artificial sweeteners. So when I'm talking about artificial sweeteners, I'm talking about things like aspartame, NutraSweet, um, not the natural sweeteners like stevia and monk fruit. I'm talking about the chemical sweeteners, okay? In a 2014 study published in Nature Magazine found that artificial sweetener consumption in both mice and human beings enhances the risk of gluco intolerance by altering our gut microbiome. These chemicals that make these sweeteners, especially uh, saccharin and aspartame, your gut microbiome hates it. It starts killing off our gut bacteria. You disrupt the gut microbiome and you end up less 
healthy. Um, humans cannot fully digest the chemicals in these sweeteners, but interestingly enough, the gut bacteria can. Um, they produce, they process the sweeteners into various short chain fatty acids that hold a wide variety of potential consequences and their production may shift the bacterial balance, okay? It's very, very, very bad for your gut. I'm not talking about stevia monk fruit, I'm talking about the artificial chemical sweeteners. Um, they know that when they've done stool samples, these chemical sweeteners lower the level of good bacteria in the gut and raise the level of bad gut bacteria. Okay, number four is artificial additives. Artificial means not found in nature. That's what I'm talking about. It means that your body does not have a way to process it. If we did not come up the evolutionary chain being exposed to these things, our bodies do not know how to process it. Ingredients like artificial coloring, which is made from petroleum, have implicated in a host of health issues. Um, hormone function and hyperactivity in children, tumor production in animal studies, there's just a lot of negativity. Certain dyes have been taken off the market due to safety issues. Um, so another study by researchers done at Georgia State University found that additives like emulsifying agents um, using to thicken foods can disrupt the bacterial of the gut, leading to inflammation and weight gain in animals and probably in humans as well. Um, so, of course, trans fats. Trans fats um, are, are man-made hydrogenated oils. Um, they have pretty much been taken off the market, but you know, they're harder to find. They used to be all the margarines had trans fats, uh, certain um, Crisco had trans fats. A lot of like the blizzard drinks and things that are um, the frozen but not dairy. Um, um, trans fats cause inflammation by damaging the cells that line the blood vessels. It's one of the biggest bad actors in atherosclerotic disease and then heart attacks. Um, uh, I would honestly consult with a nutrition science PhD. Some of this is fear mongering. This is straight up basic nutrition. I am not fear mongering. I am not fear mongering. And I'm sorry you feel that way. If you want to go have your, your Crisco Frosty, then you go do it. But I am just spreading factual nutritional inflammation to help you lower your inflammation levels. But again, you eat what you want to eat. That's fine. But I am not fear mongering. And I will not stand for somebody to say that about me. Okay. So once the U.S. consumers became aware that these trans fats were artery clogging and, and really, really bad for you, companies started pulling them out of food. Okay, we know that they're bad for us. So they started replacing it with vegetable oils. They're like, well, let's just do vegetable oil. And so vegetable oils such as soy, corn, sunflower, safflower, and palm oil, which end up having really high levels of omega-6. So not all omega-6 is bad, but we are eating 20 times the amount of omega-6 because now instead of trans fats, we're having more vegetables vegetable oils used as shortening in the cookies and the crackers and the cakes and the breads. So compared to when we came up the evolutionary chain, we are now eating 20 times the amount of omega-6 fatty acids that we should be eating. And, it, and they the breakdown products of omega-6 fatty acids tend to be pro-inflammatory, whereas the breakdown products of omega-3 fatty acids like found in fatty fish, etc., cetera, um, and, and a, lot of, a lot of nuts and... Um, seeds um, are are more anti-inflammatory. So we, you know, omega-6, we should have some in our diet. It is an essential oil, an essential fatty acid. It is important we have some, but we're eating way, 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 way too much, much, much too much. Um, so too much omega-6 can raise your blood pressure, lead to blood clots, and can cause heart attacks and stroke and cause you to retain body water. Um, omega-3 is found in, of course, again, fish, fish oil, leafy green vegetables, flaxseed, hemp seed, and walnuts. Um, Okay, fried foods. So it's not the food as much as what we're frying it in. Again, um, most of these foods commercially are fried in omega-6 oil. So again, we're getting another dose of the higher inflammatory oil. And then you, when you process foods through um, certain cooking techniques, including frying, you create something called an advanced glycation end product, which are compounds when formed with sugar, dairy, and meats are cooked at high temperatures, pasteurized, dried, smoked, fried, or grilled. And AGEs cause oxidative stress, and its receptors are found on high numbers in the heart, lungs, and skeletal muscle. Oh, thank you, baby. My husband just poured me a glass of wine. Cheers. Um, 
So researchers from the Mount, School, Mount Sinai School of Medicine found out that when people cut out processed and fried foods that had high levels of AGEs in their bloodstream, their markers of inflammation in their bodies diminished to almost nothing. So there is a subset of people who eat a tremendous amount of smoked, dried, fried, you know, foods that are heavily, have meats that are heavy and dairy that are heavily processed and um, we're just not meant to eat like that. Okay, processed meats, processed meats. Processed meats kind of represents the worst of both worlds. They're typically made from red meats, super high in saturated fats. So the leaner the meat, the healthier it tends to be. I think we've all established that. You can have some saturated fat, but your unsaturated saturated fat balance should be at least two to one, if not four to one. Okay, but most Americans are eating way more saturated fat than unsaturated fat, especially the people who are doing straight up keto. They are eating tremendous amounts of saturated fat and ending up in a pro and, you know, they're losing weight, but they're also losing muscle and they're pro, 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 pro inflammatory. Okay. And so, so these meats end up being high fat and then they process them, smoking, cooking, making the AGEs, pumping nitrates into them to make them more shelf stable. Bacon is a bad actor, you know, so in our house, when we go shopping for processed meats, lunch meat or bacon, we look for the nitrite and the sulfite free and as little processing as possible. And now they're packaged that way. They know that people who are health conscious are looking for those things. So, um, for cured meats. So, um... Okay, another thing, second round of alcohol. So for a woman, one glass of wine a day can be medicinal. But once you go past that amount, you over, you take away the health benefits and now you're ending up pro-inflammatory. So it's a very slippery slope. So if you struggle to stick to one glass of wine per night and you can't save them up for the weekend, this is per day, okay, then you're probably better off not drinking, okay? You can get the flavonoids, the antioxidants, and the other benefits from other foods. Moderation here is always, always key. Okay, so let me get to some questions. So oh, for those of you who are new, I'm Dr. Mary Claire Haver. I am a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. I am an MD. I, this is my clinic, Mary Claire Wellness. I am also a nutritionist. I have a culinary medicine certification from Tulane University. And so I spend all day talking about women's health, menopause, and nutrition. Um, I run a wellness program. And if you wanna learn more about us, we are Galveston Diet. Now, if you're like, I eat healthy, I don't believe you. I think everything's fine, but I'm gaining weight and I don't know why. I don't feel good. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Take the inflammation quiz. It's on my website. So if you just go here to Galveston Diet, also double click the screen to like the video. Double tap the screen like, like this. Bing, 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 bing. And um, so uh, I'll answer the question about the food sensitivity test in a minute. Um, so double tap the screen. Follow me if you don't follow me. I'm so honored for you to be a part of my little community and world and learn more about health and nutrition and women and all the things. And so, um, but double tapping the screen really helps TikTok show the video and then share this video if you feel like it would help someone. Um, so uh, one of the questions that I got was what about, and I'm going to talk about foods that are anti-inflammatory as well. So hold tight. Um, someone is asking, what about food sensitivity tests? Well, I've talked to registered dietitians. So the bomb, the boss in the nutrition world are registered dietitians. They have a master's degree and they've only studied nutrition and PhD nutrition scientists. Okay. So when I talk to those people who I consider to be the experts in all this, um, they say that those food allergy tests are bullshit. And so basically what the food tests are measuring is IgG antibodies to certain foods. Okay, that does not mean you're allergic um, or sensitive. That, that is a misnomer. It's, that's not how we measure food sensitivity. Um, sorry, I had to let my doggie out. Uh, so those experts say, hell to the no. It's a waste of your $100 or $200 or whatever they're charging you. You end up severely restricting because all these sensitivities come up. And the best way to figure this stuff out is just do an elimination diet. Cut all the shit out of your diet and start adding things up one by one. Oh, it takes a long time to do this. But then you can see, how do you feel? Do you feel inflamed? Is your gut hurting? Did you have diarrhea? Are you bloated? From all of that. Um... What are my thoughts on carb cycling on the keto diet? I, there is no science that I can find, none, 
that can document any real health benefits of carb cycling. I think it's a fad. If you can find me a randomized control trial where you're doing low carb and you're carb cycling versus not carb cycling and you see a clear medical benefit or documentation of inflammation rates going down or even weight loss, greater one or the other, let me know because I haven't found it yet. So, so because of that, I'm like, I think it's a fad. And, you know, I, in the Galveston diet, we don't cycle things. We build habits, daily habits that we repeat over and over and over again. So it becomes a normal, natural part of your nutrition, your program, you know, your everyday life. We build habits that are sustainable for the long term. And I get nervous when people start cycling because you're like, oh, I'll put it off. Or, oh, you know, we're human. We make mistakes. We forget. We put it off. And no, no, no. And then you end up blowing your whole program because of it. Okay, so let me see questions, questions, questions. What about stevia? Stevia is not an artificial sweetener. This is a natural sweetener. So stevia does not fall into the category of being pro-inflammatory. That being said, in the Galveston diet, we do practice intermittent fasting for the health benefits. Weight loss benefits are modest at best, but it has tremendous health benefits. So because of that, any sweeteners like stevia or monk fruit, we wait until we are in our eating window. We do not use those products while we're fasting because it stimulates the sweet receptor on the tongue and will cause a comp- can, can cause a compensatory rise in insulin. And insulin is pro-inflammatory and we try to do everything we can to keep those insulin levels low. Okay, so um, double tap the screen to like the video. I'm Dr. Mary Claire Haver, creator and founder of The Galveston Diet. Please follow me. Um, I'd be honored to have you join our community and learn more about nutrition, menopause, wellness, women's health, etc. If you want to learn more about Galveston Diet and take the inflammation quiz, which I highly recommend, um, our inflammation quiz is it's at the link in our bio. So if you go up here and click on Galveston Diet, you see the little link in bio link. Click on that. And then you'll see we have a 22% sale on all of our programs right now. And that's going to end in a couple days. So if you want to, if you've been like playing with it, thinking about it, oh my God, the time is right. 22% off right now. The code is 22 strong. It's all on the website. You can see it. Our supplements are all 22% off. So if you're like, I've been wanting to try your fiber. I really like that omega-3 and vitamin D. 22% off right now. Code 22 strong. All the links are on the web, on that link at the top of my page. So go and check it out. If you just want to take the inflammation quiz and be like, I think I'm eating fine. It'll give you a score and you'll be like, holy shit. And you can take that quiz every day and be like, and you, it's a game to see if you can get your score um, more and more and more anti-inflammatory from the nutritional choices you're making. So you, in full disclosure, you put in your email to get your score and then it will send you information all about pro and anti-inflammatory foods. Okay. So, um, all right, let's see. Questions, questions, questions. Does honey cause an inflammatory response? Yes, honey is a sugar. Now, honey does have pollen and the spores in it, which do have some anti-inflammatory pro- um, properties, but sugar is sugar is sugar in your body. Your insulin levels do not care if it's honey, table sugar, brown sugar, agave, nectar, any of that stuff. This is, okay, it's all the, the same. Um, how does this diet affect fertility? Well, if anything that lowers your chronic inflammation levels improves your ability to get pregnant, okay? If you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, we also are a low glycemic, low insulin lowering, glucose lowering eating plan. And so we have tons of students who are doing awesomely well on with polycystic ovarian syndrome in our program who are doing amazingly well. Okay, so let's go over some of the anti-inflammatory foods. So some vitamins and minerals are referred to as antioxidants are in, and they are valued for their potential in fighting cellular damage. So what happens to our cells as we're human is we have... Uh, breakdown of the cells, we have inflammation, and we have cellular damage. And that's what's, what aging is, okay? It's chronic cellular damage. We can actually slow that process down and reverse it in a few in, in, with nutritional choices. So an antioxidant is a substance that may protect cells from damage that are caused by things called free radicals. Vitamin antioxidants include vitamin A, C, and E. Mineral antioxidants include zinc, selenium, copper, and manganese. Research shows that antioxidants help prevent certain cancers, reduce cholesterol levels, and increase immune function. So before you run out and go buy all those vitamins, remember, you're way better off getting these vitamins and minerals and nutrients from food, not from 
just buying a supplement. We supplement a gap in our nutrition. The bulk of everything that you get for positive nutrition, anti-inflammatory, everything should come from food, not from supplements. You cannot supplement your way out of poor nutrition. Let me say that again. If you think you can hand, swallow a handful of supplements and, un- and negate the damage that you have done by eating those pro-inflammatory things I was talking about earlier, you're kidding yourself. It does not work that way. Supplements are meant to supplement a beautiful, healthy diet. Okay, so blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, cranberries are among the top fruit sources of antioxidants. Artichokes, kale, bell peppers, top the list of vegetables high in antioxidants. Other options include asparagus, beets, broccoli, red cabbage, and tomatoes. Notice I did not say cookies, crackers, cakes, Snickers, um, sodas, <laughs> um, walnuts, pistachios, pecans, hazelnuts, and almonds are some of the top nuts for antioxidant content. Not crazy about nuts? Try sunflower or sesame seeds, ground flaxseed, and recipes. Legumes such as kidney beans, edamame, and lentils also pack a huge antioxidant punch. Many spices are also an incredible source of antioxidants. The freshest and least processed varieties are the best. Cloves, turmeric, coffee, tea, red wine are also rich in antioxidants. Foods rich in omega-3 fatty acids are also powerful sources of anti-inflammatory components. Fatty fish, such as salmon, mackerel, or supplementing with omega. If you're allergic, you can supplement with, you know, um, uh, fish-free omega-3 oils um, if your fish isn't available. Also, remember adding antioxidants to your diet. No one food or food group should be your sole focus. Instead, be sure to cooperate. In the Galveston diet, we talk about eating the rainbow, eating a variety of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes, and spices to add to your diet. So again, if you, all this information and more, 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 more is incorporated into our nutritional plan, the Galveston diet, it is on sale, 22% off for a couple more days. If you want to grab that sale, um, it is, the link is here. So double tap the screen to like this video. Sorry, my hair's driving me crazy and I'm hot. Um, double tap the screen, like this video, share this video and follow me if you don't. Um, okay, so... Let's see. Let me go back here. Foods that fight inflammation. Okay. Um, So there's also something called the omega-6, omega-3 fatty acid ratio, which I alluded to earlier. Okay. Um, All right. So I'm going to get to the questions. Your whole body is skinny except for your belly. So you probably have a large amount of visceral fat. So there's two types of fat um, in the body when we refer to nutrition. What is subcutaneous? Yes, we have seven weeks of meal plans. Seven weeks of meal plans um, in the basic program. So, and every, if you join the VIP group, you get a new set of meal plans every month as well to keep the variety up. Um, So um, if you have a skinny body and a big belly, okay, Um, especially first thing in the morning. So a lot of us get bloated throughout the day. If you're first thing in the morning, you stand up and you look pregnant and everything else in your body is skinny, you probably have a large amount of visceral fat. You can have a normal BMI and very little subcutaneous fat and have a large amount of visceral fat. Visceral fat is different. Visceral fat is the fat inside of our abdomen. It wraps around our small bowel, our large bowel, our stomach, our liver, our, you know, all the intestines, everything. And that fat is metabolically active and produces inflammatory cytokines. The large amount of that, the higher that level of fat is in you, the more likely you are to have hypertension, diabetes, stroke, cancer, etc. It is one of the worst things in the world and has nothing to do with your BMI. Okay. It also doesn't respond to calorie restriction. People have high amounts of visceral fat due to a combination of genetics, inflammation, aging, menopause, and nutritional choices. Okay. Um, all right. So let's get to more questions. Um, oh, no. It says no questions yet. I know we had questions. Let's see if they disappeared. Okay, here we go. Does the Gaiveson diet include meal plans? Yes, we have seven total weeks of meal plans in the basic plan. If you decide to be a member of our VIP group, um, we have a monthly newsletter with extra meal plans that goes out every single month just to keep you having variety and different options in your diet. We also, in the gold and platinum program, have about a 170-page uh, meal plan guide, cookbook, um, with m- extra recipes and stuff um, that are available for you. A way to tell the different types of fat. I get this question a lot. So the gold standard is a CT or an MRI. Well, nobody has time or money for that to measure visceral fat. A DEXA scan can do it too. So ladies, if you're having a routine DEXA scan to measure your bone density, ask them to give you your visceral fat level because typically the machine will do both. 
And they'll also, you'll get to see it. It's kind of freaky looking. Um, and then second of all, you have a bioimpedance scanner. So that's what I have in my office. It's a bioelectrical impedance scanner. It's about as good as the DEXA scan, but my machine costs $20,000. I'm a doctor. I could afford it. I use it on my patients to help counsel them about visceral fat. And we make specific nutritional changes to lower their visceral fat. Um, now, everybody else, what can you do? You can do the waist hip ratio. Better to do it first thing in the morning and you need to be standing up straight, okay? And you're going to measure, okay? You're going to measure the thinnest part of your waist. So for me, it's here and the widest part of your hips. So you're gonna take this measurement in inches or centimeters, it doesn't matter, and this measurement in the same, either an inch or a centimeter. But so I'm, I am in the US, so it's inches for me. So I take this divided by this. The widest part of me here divided by the smallest part of me here. Yes, I've had children, I've had a C-section, I'm a normal 53-year-old woman. Um, so if you're like, oh, you don't look that good, some of the 25-year-old gym bros who jump on here are haters. Um, so, um, okay, so you divide the waist by the hip. For a woman, greater than 0.85 suggests that you have high levels of visceral fat. Hey, baby. And then for a man, it's 0.9 suggests that you have high levels of visceral fat. And so um, that's kind of how we do it. So in the Galveston diet, we all measure. When they start the program, we advise people to measure their waist hip ratio. And then they measure it at the end of their six weeks or however long they stick with the program. So, mm. Oh, you're in love with the cookbook and the Galveston diet plan. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Is dairy always bad? No. Only if you have a protein allergy, an allergy to the dairy, the protein found in milk products, or you're lactose intolerant. And if you're lactose intolerant, there's a lot of lactose-free options for dairy that you can have and be perfectly fine with it. So for me, I'm Cajun. We don't have any dairy issues. Um, but a lot of people are, a lot of like cultures are. Asians, no dairy. They don't tolerate it at all. Um, for the most part, not all. I don't want to, you know be um, flippant about you know cultures but um you know it's very common for someone with an asian background to not tolerate lactose at all so um okay let's see but i don't have any trouble with it uh how do we lose or reduce visceral fat so right now in the galveston diet i'm doing a belly fat challenge visceral fat challenge and so there's some key things that you can do it doesn't really respond well to caloric restriction responds it responds really well to nutritional changes so the, anything that will lower your insulin or your glucose levels will lower your visceral fat levels so making sure you're getting enough fiber in your diet for women that's 25 grams a day for men i believe it's 32 i don't study men so cuz i'm a gynecologist but um but for sure, women, 25 grams per day, minimum. I push for 35 a day. Sometimes I go 40 or 50, depending on the day. Number 10, and that's through food, not just supplements. Okay, don't run out and buy a fiber supplement and think you're good. Um, number two is making sure that your added sugars, added sugars found in the cooking and processing of foods, not fruits and veggies, okay, added sugar content is less than 25 grams a day, and aerobic activity in the fat-burning zone so moving your body so that you're burning in the fat burning zone. So for most people, it's 220 minus your age. And so for what, 53, you know, it's 170 something. And so 60 to 70% of your max heart rate, which is 220 minus your age. So for me, it's about eh, 105 to 115. So when I'm trying to do a fat burning workout, I try to get my heart rate around 110 and stay there. So, um, Let's see, uh, answering questions, back down to the question. Remember the questions are down below. So take a break, everybody double tap your screen to like the video. Okay, like this video, like this video. If you haven't followed me, please follow me, I'm happy. And then share this video. There's a little button right here um, that you can click and share this video with someone you feel like it would be helpful for. Double tapping the screen um, helps uh, TikTok show the video to more people. Um, thank you for sharing the video. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're over 500 people. That's pretty cool. Um, while I answer questions, um, is intermittent fasting safe for diabetics? Never for a type 1 diabetic, ever. Type 2 diabetes, it depends. So you need to talk to your doctor first. So when we have students in the Galveston diet who are type 2 diabetics, we always say send the link to the program to your physician. Make sure that they're okay with this. Certain medications for diabetes, type 2 diabetes, do not lend themselves to. So always clear it with your physician first if you're under any medical treatment for any reason before you start any new nutrition program. Was I ever overweight? So um, I was never obese. I can tell you that. Um, I was overweight, according to my BMI. 
I, um, uh, high school, my senior year, stopped doing cheer. Like the end of the year was, um, start at 18 was the drinking age. And so alcohol started becoming uh, a factor. And then I was living at my grandma's and she was feeding me processed carbohydrates all day, which was amazingly delicious, covered in sugar and all the things. So I gained 30 between senior year and freshman year of college. I gained probably 40 pounds. Okay. I went from this little skinny cheerleader to, um, someone with a tremendous amount of curves, but I was all in my midsection. I still had skinny arms and legs. So I had like face, big boobs, big gut, and a big butt. Um, then I kind of, you know, by the end of college, got like 15 of that off and then, um, was working, got some more off, went, but went to work. Then I went to medical school. Then I became really, really thin again, like med school. I just stopped eating. I start, I realize now that I was just stressed, not eating and starving myself, not on purpose, but it's just kind of what my stress did and lost muscle, lost fat, became very, 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 very thin. Like people thought I had cancer when I went home to visit, it was bad. And I got down to like 115. Okay. So then, you know, life goes on. I get a job, I get pregnant. I gained 50 pounds with each baby. And, but I was able to get it off within like six months. Um, so I ate everything in sight that was not nailed down during my pregnancies. Um, and then I, um, Went through menopause and my brother died, so I was like just just hoovering goldfish every day and drinking too much wine and going through menopause, and I had probably another 20-pound weight gain then, um, and then I was kind of kicking myself in the butt, like, okay, that's when the Galveston diet started, when I started doing more research about nutrition and menopause and what are we doing wrong, because calories in, calories out had completely stopped working for me. So through my life, I'm 53, yes, I have been overweight, but never obese. Um, how do you get more natural fiber without wheat? That's such a good question. Thank you for asking. Okay, so hang on. The sun is finally starting to set. I can open up our windows. I want to see my sunset. Oh, it's kind of hard to see, but um, it's a beautiful night. Um, Okay, so whole grain is a source. So corn is a whole grain, um, millet, you know, there's lots of whole grain things that you can have that are high in fiber, but legumes, your beans, your okra, your, um, you know, every type of bean in the world. A lot of nuts can be high in fiber. Berries are high in fiber. Um, cruciferous vegetables are high in fiber. Anything with a crunch, that is fiber that you're crunching. So, um, so yeah, beans, veggies, fruit, all very high in fiber. You can hit your fiber goals absolutely, especially if you're having legumes. Um, okay, uh, what fibers are good? So we just kind of covered that one. I'm going through the questions, guys. Um, let's see. Is buying pre-cooked salmon and chicken too processed? So fresh is always best. Fresh is always best, cooking it from scratch. Um, but pre-cooked, you know, if you're buying a rotisserie chicken at the store, that's pretty much as good as cooking it at home, okay? That's a pretty, because they take a fresh chicken, they just put it in their oven instead of you putting it in your oven. Very different than, you know, and it depends on if you're pre-cooking it at a deli where they're just putting it in an oven where you can see versus sucking the air out of it, adding nitrites to it, you know, that kind of thing. So if it would be as if you were cooking it yourself, then that's pretty good. It's just when it's packaged that you have to start worrying that they're adding things that are pro-inflammatory to the cooking. Um, added sugar or total sugar? Add, so now since April of 2021, added sugars have to be on the labels of food, okay? Labels of packaging. And so when we talk about added sugars, it's the sugars added in the cooking. I gotta let the dog out again. Cooking and processing of food. Okay, buddy, wanna see him? Hi, Rex, wanna go outside? Bye, buddy. See if you can see it now. Okay. The sun is going down. I live kind of on a bayou. Okay. It's a beautiful night. I'm going to leave the door open. Let my dog run around. Um, so when we talk about that, it's the added sugars, not fruits and veggies. So not total sugar. Okay. Um, it is beautiful. I'm super, super, super fortunate to live here despite hurricanes and everything else. Um, okay. So... How do you lower your LDL without going on meds? Avoid nutritional things that raise LDL and eat fruits, vegetables, and get at least 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day will go a long way to help reversing your cholesterol changes. Um, 
especially if it's not familial and you, you're carrying a gene that causes you to have high cholesterol. Um, okay, so olive's good for high LDL, high in omega-6 and omega-3. They're kind of equal in omega-6 and omega-3. They may have a little bit more omega-6, but remember, um, olive oil, you know, olives especially, if, if oh, the omega-6 was put there by God and it's not extracted, it's fine to eat. That's what I tell my students. Don't get so hung up on omega-6 and omega-3 if it's nature put it there. But if it's an extracted oil pumped into other food is where we're getting into trouble. Um, how bad is pasta? Should you do gluten-free? Well, it depends on the pasta. There's a lot of really healthy whole grain pasta, chickpea pasta, but Anything made with processed flour and carbohydrates, just white flour is not good for you, it is going to cause more inflammation, has very little nutritional value, and is nothing but sugar in sheep's clothing, okay? It's nothing but the endosperm. So it's not going to do anything healthy for you at all. So there are other pasta options that are whole grain or made from a different form, you know, a pasta made from chick I mean, lentils or chickpeas or whatever that are, can be very, very healthy. You just have to know what you're looking for and read your labels. All right, guys, it is time for me to spend some time with my husband and family. It was so awesome talking to you tonight. On your way out, please double tap the screen and follow me if you don't follow me. Um, and I'll continue sharing content and trying to educate you guys as to what is healthy. Also, check out our Facebook page, our TikTok page, our Instagram. Um, go look at some of the videos that I have and feel free to share any of my information and videos that I post on social media. And check out our website. Remember, we have a sale on the Gallison Diet for another couple of days. The code is 22 strong. If you go, if you go up here to this Galveston Diet link, it will take you directly to our um, it will take you to our link and bio page. So you see my picture and some information. Click on the link and bio. You can take our inflammation quiz. You can look at our supplements. You can click the link to save 22% on our programs and um, enjoy. All right, everybody, have a good night.